Tell someone that everything will be great, and they're likely to either shrug you off or offer a skeptical eye. Tell someone they're in danger, and now you have their undivided attention. Put that coffee down. Creators are leaders. Be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. They realized that to be in power, you didn't need guns or money or even numbers. You just needed the will to do what the other guy wouldn't. I'm not leaving. The show goes on. Well, hello there, friend. Welcome back to the Construction Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Bradley Hartman. Now, with the summer upon us, it is time for our quarterly APB. And no, it's not an all-points bulletin. It is nothing nearly as serious as that. It's a recommended trio of content, an article, a podcast, and a book, one each, that I believe is worth your time and attention. First up, The article. My family and I recently watched the new Avatar movie titled The Way of Water. It cost an estimated $350 to $400 million and took 12 years to make. Now, while it was long, my wife and my 11-year-old didn't make it to the end, it was pretty incredible. And that is how director James Cameron rolls big. Cameron has been responsible for some of the most expensive movies ever made. Terminator, Rambo, First Blood, Part 2, Aliens, The Abyss, Terminator 2, True Lies, Titanic, and Avatar. Now, regardless of the cost, how many, I ask you, how many were unprofitable? Zero. Not one. Every single movie has made money. So with that in mind, I went looking for more information on James Cameron and stumbled into this article by GQ Magazine's Zach Barron. It's titled, The Return of James Cameron, Box Office King. The link is in the show notes, and at the top of the article, you can choose to listen to the article as well. No app necessary. It's pretty slick. You just hit play. But there are two specific segments of the article that I think will resonate with you. And the first is about the magnetism for difficult. Here's a quote from the article. But as Cameron worked late into the evening, day after day, solving the infinite problems that the way of water continued to present, he seemed to be enjoying himself. I like difficult, he told me. I'm attracted by difficult. Difficult is a magnet for me. I go straight to difficult. And I think it probably goes back to this idea that there are lots of smart, really gifted, really talented filmmakers out there that just can't do the difficult stuff. So that gives me a tactical edge to do something that nobody else has ever seen because the really gifted people don't want to do it. The second excerpt here that I want to call attention to is about leveraging expertise, which is what this APB is all about. Leveraging the experience and wisdom of other people to speed our own personal development and the progress of our teams and our networks. Here's the quote. It was while working as a truck driver in his 20s that Cameron decided to become a filmmaker. And so he taught himself filmmaking. He'd go to the stacks at the library at USC, University of Southern California, home of a vaunted filmmaking program Cameron couldn't afford. I'd find somebody's 300-page dissertation on optical printing, Cameron said. And I'd be going through it and I'd think, well, I gotta get this. So I'd pull the staples out and I'd photocopy the entire 300 pages. And then I just kept doing the same thing week after week for about six months. And I'm driving a truck, but I had these binders, sodium process, blue screen, optical printing, film stock emulsions, lenses, cinematography. I was either getting stoned and watching Saturday Night Live's first season, or I was going through this stuff, chapter and verse, making my own notes and all that. I basically gave myself a college education in visual effects and cinematography while I was driving a truck. Now, it begs a pair of questions for the ambitious among us. Number one, what are you willing to do with your schedule to improve yourself? And number two, whose work are you learning from so you don't have to find all the answers and make all the mistakes yourself? Speaking of Saturday Night Live, for any of you that also have a typeface and font OCD like I do, I cannot think, let alone write about or record about Avatar without thinking of the SNL short with Ryan Gosling. 
this again. I forgot about it for years, but then I remembered that Avatar, a giant international blockbuster, used the papyrus font as its logo. Avatar, the movie from like nine years ago? Yeah, he just highlighted Avatar, he clicked the drop down menu, and then he just randomly selected papyrus, like a, like a thoughtless child just wandering by a garden, just yanking leaves along the way. And so now you're worried about the sequels that are coming out? They're making more? You've shown me this before. I don't even think this is literally papyrus. Maybe that was a starting point, but they clearly modified this. Well, whatever they did, it wasn't enough! <laughs> now, this is as close as I can come to explain what it's like inside my head. I'm not proud of it. It, it just is. It's like being left-handed or, I don't know, red-headed. Now for the podcast. One of my favorite new podcasts is called Invest Like the Best with Patrick O'Shaughnessy. The podcast title caused me some consternation as I'm largely disinterested in listening to finance and investing podcasts, but this isn't like that at all. O'Shaughnessy has strong hosting skills and he's got a wide array of guests on the show, including relatively recent episodes featuring an African animal tracker and venture capital legend Doug Leone. Both of them were great. He also had Daryl Morey, the general manager of the Philadelphia 76ers, on an episode that published on January 24th, 2023, and I listened to it twice, back to back, and ultimately used a clip of it in my new book on negotiating. Here's a little excerpt of the book that then leads into the clip from this podcast episode. Section 6.8, Post Agreement Deal Improvement. So congrats, you got your deal done. You've successfully navigated the three F's of negotiation, feelings, fairness, and finances. From the jump, you embrace the proactive mindset of believing in negotiation the journey, not simply negotiation the event. You've been focused on developing a strong pipeline of deals, so the angel of Herbie Cohen is always perched on your shoulder, whispering, care, but not that much. You've demonstrated that negotiation is indeed a collaborative communication process built on curiosity, creativity, and active listening. Good job, you. Well done. But maybe, maybe you're not done? An expert negotiator, Daryl Morey, former NBA general manager of the Houston Rockets and currently of the Philadelphia 76ers, encourages negotiators to land a deal that works for both parties. And remember, you got to implement this thing too, after all and then continue to explore how it could be improved. In a January 2023 podcast episode of Invest Like the Best with Patrick O'Shaughnessy, Maury mentioned he took advantage of the NBA lockout in 2011 to attend a two-week on-campus negotiation course at Harvard. On the negotiation class, was there any one thing that was like an aha moment for you that you've used since that you would recommend people think about when negotiating? I'd say probably the number one I liked was Post-negotiation, negotiation. So that's after you shake hands deal. Often during the negotiation, you have to sort of not be super clear sometimes about your true values of certain things. Once you have a deal, though, and you actually there's trust on both sides, and that's true in basketball because it's a repeating game. So once there's trust and you've said deal, then you can say like, okay, we have a deal. That deal is always going to happen. But now that we have that deal... I will be more open to how I'm valuing all my things in the deal and other possible ones. If we can come up by working together and now every card's on the table, a better deal, let's see if we can do that. I'll give an example. In our sport, in the collective bargaining agreement, there are certain players you have to put in just to match salary. And the proposal we made that you said deal to, we included this player, but We're actually just as fine to include these other three players. If you want to select that and maybe you make the second round pick that you include slightly better because you're going to get a slightly better deal here. Often it's a little hard to do because sometimes our deadlines get in the way. Once you have a deal at the trade deadline, for example, they won't let you modify it. But if it's a deal done around the draft, you can do that. But yeah, I would encourage, and I've seen this in many industries, people don't do this, that. Once a deal is done, 
try to then negotiate a slightly better deal for both sides. Also at the 37 minute mark, more or less, uh, Daryl Morey talks about the ridiculous rules of soccer or international football and how to fix the game as a somewhat disinterested third party. It's funny and smart and true. And now for the book. Run, do not walk. That's right. Do not walk and buy a few copies of The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. It is one of those rare books whose insights and stories, they feel familiar and they feel absolutely true, but they're delivered in a unique way you haven't heard before. His thesis is that how we think about, save, and spend money has far more to do with how we were raised and how we feel about money than our risk tolerance modern portfolio theory, or diversification. Chapter four in his book is titled Confounding Compounding. And his little quip there that he has on each one of the chapters says, 81.5 billion of Warren Buffett's 84.5 billion net worth came after his 65th birthday. I'm gonna read that again. 81.5 billion of Warren Buffett's 84.5 billion net worth came after his 65th birthday. Our minds, he writes, are not built to handle such absurdities. And I've been thinking just a lot about compounding in general and how we use this in our personal lives. And I think this podcast is one example. We've done 350 plus episodes and we're just going to do it forever until I die or until I stop, whichever comes first. We're just going to do it forever. And every single year, despite the investment in time and money and everything that goes into it, there is a compounding effect that comes with it, and it opens a door for serendipity. And no, I have no idea on when this show will actually deliver an annual positive ROI, but what I do know is that if we deliver our best stuff and we continue to work at it and we get better and we connect with the smartest people in our industry, good things will happen on a long enough timeline because of this compounding effect. Going back to Buffett, he writes, his skill is investing, but his secret is time. That's how compounding works. Think of this another way. Buffett is the richest investor of all time, but he's not actually the greatest, at least not when measured by average annual returns. Jim Simons, head of the hedge fund Renaissance Technologies, has compounded money at 66% annually since 1988. No one comes close to this record. As we just saw, Buffett has compounded at roughly 22% annually, a third as much. Simon's net worth, as I write, is $21 billion. He is, and I know how ridiculous this sounds given the numbers we're dealing with, 75% less rich than Buffett. Little digression here. If you are interested in reading about Jim Simons, this guy they're talking about here, a fascinating book called The Man Who Beat the Market, I would also recommend to a friend. But his point is, Buffett isn't the greatest investor. He's just been doing it for like 80 some years. He started before he was 10 years old. And while yes, he's been brilliant and he's made some really good choices, he's allowed time and the compounding effect to work for him. Chapter seven is titled Freedom, Controlling Your Time is the Highest Dividend Money Pays. I will say that every single person we work with, whether it's a project manager, whether it's a CEO or executive, or it's a sales rep who's just getting started, every one of them we talk about and dig beneath the layers of how we think about and what we do with our time and the freedom we have and our autonomy with our time. And I'm doing the same thing with myself. This entire chapter really connects the dots between how we value our time and what we do with it. And I found it to be really profound. Lastly, I would just highlight chapter 16 titled You and Me, Beware Taking Financial Cues from People Playing a Different Game Than You Are. I don't know about you, but I have a few friends who are not in the financial markets professionally, but they kind of buy and sell their own stocks and they love telling me about their brilliant moves they made. They never tell me how they lost money. They only tell me how they made money and they make recommendations to me. And I just kind of smile and I ask the little details and I'm like, yeah. That's not the game that I'm playing. And here on page 173, he writes, a takeaway here is that few things matter more with money than understanding your own time horizon and not being persuaded by the actions and behaviors of people playing different games than you are. The main thing I can recommend is going out of your way to identify what game you're playing. It's surprising how few of us do. We call everyone investing money, quote unquote, investors, like they're basketball players 
all playing the same game with the same rules. When you realize how wrong that notion is, you see how vital it is to simply identify what game you're playing. Years ago, I wrote out, and this is not me, this is Morgan writing. I wrote out, I am a passive investor optimistic in the world's ability to generate real economic growth, and I'm confident that over the next 30 years, that growth will accrue to my investments. Now, I don't know about you, maybe all of you have your own statement about how you invest and save money and your views of that, but until I read this on page 173, I didn't. And then I got with my wife and we spent about 15 minutes and we knocked it out. And now it's like, yeah, this is what we're doing. So if we ever get this itch to like double down and invest in Twitter or something like that, we should just read this and think, what are we doing? Oh yeah, this is our strategy. This is our strategy statement. And let's just stick to the plan. This is the game we're playing. And the last thing I'll note here is his discussion in chapter 17 about the seduction of pessimism. He writes, pessimism just sounds smarter and more plausible than optimism. Tell someone that everything will be great, and they're likely to either shrug you off or offer a skeptical eye. Tell someone they're in danger, and now you have their undivided attention. I couldn't agree more in this understanding about optimism and pessimism and where you fall you know, in that spectrum and how it relates to finances and investing is so important. So if I continue on, I'm just going to like read this entire book to you, which you don't want. I don't need to do. Morgan Housel already did that. It's on Audible. All I will say, if you or anyone you know uses money, I'd strongly recommend you invest in this book now. But I think it's true that everyone, myself, you, everyone, has a model in their head of how they think the world works and how they think the economy works. And that model is just heavily influenced based off of our personal, unique experiences in life. And what I've experienced is different from what you've experienced, different from what my parents have experienced. Everyone has a different view of the world based off of the unique kind of happenstance of what they've seen in the world. And I think that's, that's a really, really important thing because I've experienced and you've experienced this much of what's happened in the world, but it influences a lot of what we think about the world. And I can try to be empathetic and open-minded to experiences that I did not experience firsthand, whether it's the Great World War II, the inflation in the 1970s that I didn't experience. I can try to open my mind to that, but I don't have the emotional scar tissue of someone who lived through that uh, that, that they went through. So, of course, there's all these studies that people know about that the generation who came of age during the Great Depression, that stuck with them for the rest of their life. And how they thought about debt and risk and the, the stock market, that stuck with them for life in a way that their children, the baby boomers, couldn't really comprehend because they didn't experience it themselves. They may have heard the stories from their parents, but they didn't experience it. And my generation, the millennials, did not experience the inflation of the 1970s and 80s. My parents did. So we, with the same information, the same education, we think about inflation in very different ways. And we, we saw this one decade ago when gold as an investment was really popular uh, when, when, the, when central banks were printing a lot of money after the financial crisis. The generation for whom that was most popular with were the baby boomers. And the younger generation, my generation, didn't really know what, was, what, what all the fuss was about because we didn't, ex we didn't experience gas lines and 15% mortgage rates like people who live through that do. So your experience have a huge impact on how you think about the world. Several years ago, I, I interviewed Daniel Kahneman, the psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in economics. And he mentioned at one point that he's the biggest pessimist he's ever met. He said, no one is more pessimistic on the outlook of humanity than he is. And I said, wow, that's, that's really interesting. Is that because you have all this insight into behavioral biases and how people think? And he said, no. He said, I'm a pessimist because I grew up in Nazi-occupied France. And he said he saw from an early age how evil people can be. He experienced from an early age how evil people can be, which is obviously not an experience that I had. And I can read about it. I can think about it, but I don't have the scar tissue that he does. And, and it changed how he thought about risk across all kinds of fields for the rest of his life. And I think we all have something like that. All right, there you go. That is your APB. The article was on James Cameron from GQ. The P was the podcast, Invest Like the Best with Patrick O'Shaughnessy, that one with GM of the 76ers, Daryl Morey. And the book was The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. But because the giving never ends around here at the Construction Leadership Podcast, here are three shows. That's right. We did no shows or documentaries or anything that I would recommend. The first is called The Diplomat. It stars Carrie Russell, the girl from Felicity. I know I'm dating myself here a little bit. And more recently, The Americans. Neither show of which I watched, but I love Carrie Russell. 
Ambassador Catherine Weiler, Prime Minister Nicol Trowbridge. Welcome. Sir, it's an honour to meet you. Ah, honour to be met. <laughs> Someone is luring a strike force into the Persian Gulf. The President is sending you to stop a war before it starts. Not butter a crumpet. Welcome to London, Ambassador Weiler. Tell me how. I'm the ambassador's wife. My husband was an ambassador for a long time. This will be an adjustment. You need to lean into the Cinderella thing. I'm not doing this the way you would. That's fine. Just don't do it wrong. My wife and I fell into the show, The Diplomat, and we ripped through the entire season one in three evenings. And while I'm not a big fan of Arnold Schwarzenegger, starting in 1994's movie Junior, uh, that's the one where he is uh, pregnant, his new documentary on Netflix, simply titled Arnold, is great. I've watched the first episode twice and I realized I'm not doing nearly a good enough job of articulating to my team the vision of our company, where we're going, what it's going to feel like when we get there, and why it's worth the struggle. I sold myself on that stage. Ladies and gentlemen, Arnold Schwarzenegger! Thousands of people screaming, Arnold, Arnold, Arnold. And when you visualize something very clearly, you believe that you 100% can get there. Lastly, for real this time, there's a show on Peacock called Poker Face, starring the raspy-voiced girl from American Pie, released back in 1999, in case you missed it. And apparently, because my wife tells me, Orange is the New Black. It's a sarcastic whodunit with each episode featuring some big-time actors, and it's a lot of fun. So that's all we've got. If you have any other APBs for us, articles, podcasts, or books that you believe deserve some attention on our next quarterly APB, you can email us directly at info, I-N-F-O, at bradleyhartmanandco.com. That's info at bradleyhartmanandco.com. That's all we've got. I appreciate you listening. You will find links for all of these in the show notes to make it easy for you to consume. So we will close out with our leadership mantra. You, my friend, are owed nothing. Deliver value first. Make it a great week.